The evil of slavery has left an ugly and an enduring legacy in the United States. Racism in its various forms has continued on through decades, and it is the responsibility of Catholics to help end that injustice. But how? Today we'll discuss how Catholics can best respond to the sin of racism with special guest Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, author of the book Father Augustus Tolton, the slave who became the first African-American priest. I'm Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka, President of Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we're talking today about a Catholic response to racism. I'm joined by our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology in the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. And we're pleased to welcome our special guest, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, Deacon Harold received a BA in economics from the University of Notre Dame and his master's in theological studies from the University of Dallas. Deacon is a popular speaker and national radio and EWTN television host. And he's also author of num numerous books, including Behold the Man, A Catholic Vision of Male Spirituality and Father Augustus Tolton, The Slave Who Became the First African-American Priest. We welcome Deacon, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, it's a, a tremendous honor to be here. We've Thank been you. very blessed to have you on our campus uh, numerous times and it's always a great, great blessing to have you. Thank you. Uh, maybe just the first question, why did you write this book? Well, it's uh, actually a great story. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, I grew up in, in Newark, Archdiocese of Newark, that's when confirmation was. So I was looking oh, for great. a confirmation saint. And they were listing all these amazing saints, St. Dominic, St. Francis of Assisi. But I remember thinking, Boy, I wonder if there's anybody that looks like me, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? So I went to the library, and you all remember libraries, the card catalog I've heard before of them. internet. I've heard yeah, of them. I know. Yeah, yeah. And so I went looking, and, I, I, and as I was looking on the shelf, I accidentally came across a book called From Slave to Priest by Sister Carolyn Hemesath mm -hmm. about Father Augustus Tolton. I'd never heard of this guy before. Hey. I never, so I, I, I took it off the shelf and I just looked through it. I'm like, oh, I couldn't use him because he, he's not a saint. Can I say? But I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And I put it back on the shelf and kept searching. And interestingly enough, uh, I ended up choosing the name Philip, the deacon from Acts of the Apostles. So oh, God, okay. God yeah, has yeah, a yeah. sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> before you knew, he knew. That's right. That's, that's right. And so now fast forward years later, it's 2002 and Ignatius Press buys the rights to the book oh, okay. from Sister Hemesath and republishes the book on Father Tolton and asks me to write the new forward. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the forward and promoted the book and kind of reintroduced myself to him again. And I, I kind of I fell in love with him and his story and his passion mm -hmm. for the faith. And so my book is not about his life, mm -hmm. But my book is about lessons we can learn from, from his, his life. life. Right, right. You know, things like overcoming racism, building strong families, the power of prayer, finding joy in God's mercy. Uh, so, uh, so how can his life influence our life uh, today in the 21st century? Yeah. His story is almost uh, too good to be true. It's sheerly unbelievable, the kind of courage that he evinced and the sufferings that were inflicted. And yet his response was never a rage or retaliation, but a kind of a quiet, serene submission. This is God's will, you know, this folly of divine abandonment. It, it's an intoxicating story, but it's hard to believe. Yeah, it is in, in a sense, you know, because the question that I had after reading the book the first time was, why didn't he leave the church? Yeah. Right. right. I mean, after everything he's been through, yeah. you know, the rejection from every seminary in the United States rejecting because he was black, yeah. you know, being called, um, you know, very vile names yeah. by other priests after he was already ordained the priest, the rejection of his family when he was young, you know, jumping from parish to parish until they found a parish that actually accepted them. And the question is, why didn't he leave? 
Yeah. And then when you when you look at his well, the major speech that he gave at the first National Black Catholic Congress, he said <laughs> basically he's following the teachings, not the people. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because the teachings of the church are still true, good, and beautiful, despite the people in the church. Right. They can say all sinners in need of God's mercy. Yeah, say something about that. That that the church is teaching on racism is not necessarily been reflected by the people, but yes. the, the church has consistently spoken against racism, correct? That's correct. And um, uh, Father Joel Panzer has yes. a great book. The Popes and Slavery. The Popes and Slavery, oh, right. where he catalogs, you yeah. know, the, the teachings of the Pope century yeah. after century after century um, that basically excommunicated people uh, if they had slaves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that uh, now there, there's some some people say, well, wait a minute, weren't there some folks who I encouraged slavery? Well, we have to kind of uh, define what we understand by slavery here, right. okay? Because um, when people think of slavery, they think of chattel slavery, right. the kind of slavery that was exercised in the 18th and 19th centuries in this country, yes, or as the Israelites were subjected to uh, by Egypt in the Book of Exodus. That's not the type of slavery that we're that, that we're talking okay, about okay. here. Right. Um, even in the Old Testament, there's different. You know, this, Dr. Yeah. <laughs> of course, there's different. When they talk about slavery, they're not talking about chattel slavery because God was very clear that Israelite was not to exercise that form this of slavery. This is an important point. I mean, yes. Abraham in Genesis 14 has 318 homeborn servants trained for war which presumes that he had a lot of other homeborn servants who were trained for other things besides war. You know, and so there is chattel slavery, but there's also what was called domestic slavery yes. because the term family is derived from famalus. But when you look at the original meaning and usage of famalus in ancient Latin, it designates the majority of references are referring to servants who are part of the famalus, who are essential to the family and are treated with dignity as well. They're not the same as the son who is designated to inherit, but they go along with that family from generation to generation. Now, I'm not going to defend it. I just want to clarify the distinction that you just made because I was oblivious to this difference and why it was that when you're reading the New Testament and Paul does not call for the abolition of slavery, it's because he's got an entirely different model that he assumes than chattel slavery. Yeah, exactly. So, so for example, um, if you were if you were poor, or there was a famine that was happening, right. and you could not feed your family, you would sell yourself, in a sense, into right. slavery, right. which is yeah. basically kind of an indentured servitude. Yeah. Um, and and, the, uh, and so you would work for this family; they fed you and took care of you. Now, if you look at uh, the kind of juxtaposition between the ancient Near East practice and the Jewish practice, the Jewish practice ended at the Jubilee year. You released all the slave, slaves at the end of the Jubilee year. In the ancient Near East, it was after about four years. That's uh, right. Uh, That's until right. the debt was paid back. Right. Or it was also used as punishment, like for today. You know, sometimes you see the prisoners out on the road doing community service. So that type of slavery was also used as a, a, a punishment for, for certain crimes. Before the well. Quakers introduced the first penitentiary in Philadelphia at the end of the 18th century, this was much more common. There was a punishment or there was a kind of indentured servanthood. You know, and Robert North wrote a book called The Sociology of the Biblical Jubilee that shocked me years ago because the idea of releasing slaves every seven years or in the year of Jubilee, allowing them to go back to their land, this was rather common in the ancient Near East. Again, a conception that is sort of completely lost to historians today, but one that affirms the dignity of these people, not as property, right. but as persons who are part of this extended family. And that's when, the, when it says the Pope supports slavery, that's, that's what right. the Pope exactly. were talking about. Right. And it was a qualified support because yes. it always was backed by the biblical principle of release, that this is a temporary situation that was an accommodation to a weakness or to a crime or whatever. You know, but uh, again, the Catholic Church, and that book by Father Panzer was originally a master's thesis. I remember reading it and urging him to get, get it published because it was just eye-opening, you know, but so is this. I mean, in so many ways, Father Tolton's story takes it from the theory and the history of papal teaching to the reality of how can bishops and priests ostracize right. a man 
just because, it, yeah, it's, it's mind-boggling. Well, even your own uh, religious order refused him. Mm -hmm. He wanted to get ordained, and the Franciscans said no, but everybody else said no, and he didn't find welcome until he applied for Rome, and they were delighted to have him. And, and then the Jesuits eventually welcomed him in Chicago. Right. But, but, but yeah, one but is... There was a Franciscan priest, though, who did right. help him get That's into right. yeah, Rome, Rome by writing the Superior General right, right, right. in Rome with the Franciscans. But, but the happened. striking thing are the ironies. Uh, for example, on his baptismal uh, <laughs> yes. uh, certificate, yes. they have his name and the date of the baptism. And then there's this pause followed by owned by the yeah. property of this guy. Yeah, yeah uh, it says Augustus John Tolton, property of Stephen Elliott, yeah. on his baptismal, Catholic right. baptismal yeah, 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 certificate. Right, right, that's extraordinary. Yeah. 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 But the church, so in his experience of racism, how would you articulate the, at the heart of the, the sin of racism and, and how does the church speak to racism? And, how I, one of the things I appreciate is his his point was is that it was very experiential. You could see yes. this, you could hear it, but I, I want to get away from just like kind of the theory at the heart of this. What what okay. was the injustice? Well, we need to, to define what racism means, Please. because right now everything is being conflated. Everything is racist. Everything is racist. So when so let's talk, differentiate racist and prejudice. A prejudice is a um, uh, a stereotype. It's a uh, uh, it, it's making a judgment of someone based on no observable facts or experience, all right? Uh, and racism is prejudice with the added piece that the reason why I believe this and the reason why I'm saying this is because I believe my race is superior to your race. Okay. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, at a parish mission not long ago, uh, a gentleman found out that I went to Notre Dame for my undergraduate degree. So he goes to me, he goes, oh, you went to Notre Dame. What position did you play? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You see? So now people would hear that comment and think, that was racist. Right. But it actually wasn't. It was prejudice. It was ignorant. Right. right? Because I could see what was going on in his mind. Sure. Big black gentleman plus Notre Dame equals football. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, but the fact is, I never played football in my life. Right, yeah. I had academic scholarship to Notre Dame. Right, yeah. So that, that statement would have been racist if he meant when he said it. Right. The reason why I'm That's saying that. this is because I believe that black people aren't smart enough to get into Notre Dame, and right, the only reason right, you can right. get in there is on a football scholarship. Yeah. But he, didn't, he was thoroughly embarrassed when he found out yeah, sure. <laughs> that, but he said that I didn't play football. So, so, um, so, what, so when he said that, you know, I didn't take it as racist at all. And when he found out the truth, he's like, he was embarrassed. Mm. So we can't conflate everything right, as, as right. being racist. Yeah, I mean, the optics, I think, are entirely on his side. If you watch any NFL football, you realize most of the players are black. But it doesn't follow from that that they don't know the alphabet. No, that's that's right. They're it. big and beefy and brutal. Yeah, what he should have asked me was, oh, you went to Notre Dame, what did you study? Yeah. Because wow. that's what he would have asked anybody else. Yeah. Well, these days, nobody studies anything. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> now, one of, the, one of the things you said, Deacon, is you said uh, racism is learned. Yes. Is it, speak yes. to that. I thought that was so, very common. So the reason why racism is a sin, because it denies the reality yeah. that we are all made in the image and likeness of God, and that we have an inherent dignity given to us by God, and right. racism denies that reality, right. and that's why it's sinful. But racism is learned. For example, I have kids, and, and when they were little, um, and they're playing with other kids on the playground. Asian, black, white, Hispanic. They, they, they don't care. They're just playing. They're just being <laughs> kids. Just they're being kids. They're playing. Yeah. Yeah. It's only later, after being exposed to uh, television and media and movies and jokes from parents and relatives and friends, mm -hmm. where, you know, uh, where after a while you hear these things and without really understanding or, or, or kind of filter to really understand what is going on here experientially, um, they begin to think, well, maybe that's true, or maybe that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's how it is, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And, and the result of that is really hurtful. Uh, I remember a time I was speaking um, at an event called Holy Fire, which is kind of like a, a middle school version of the, the Franciscan, okay. the, the Steubenville uh, 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 conferences, okay. which are fantastic, by the way, okay. Father. Um, and I was dressed just like I am now, crucifix, deacon pin, suit, I walk into an elevator, and there's a little uh, white woman in there, and I just smiled and, and nodded my head to acknowledge her. I didn't say anything. 
and her eyes got really big and she backed up and grabbed her purse. Mm. Like she backed up to the back of the elevator and grabbed her purse, her eyes were, mm. and I'm like, oh, she's scared. And so I didn't say anything. I turned around, I pushed the floor. I, I didn't say anything. And I got off the elevator, I got to my floor. Now, why was she afraid of me? No. You know, I mean, and I get it. I was in law enforcement for 23 years. I've done rape investigations. So I understand, um, you know, post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. from going through a situation. And I also understand that when you're in a confined space and with a stranger, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Sure. Uncomfortable is one thing. Backing up and grabbing a person is something else. Right, right. You know, and when that happens to you time right. after time, it hurts. Yeah, it really does. It hurts you know, because my, people don't see you. Right. They see an exterior. They don't see you. But, and that's that's at the heart of this thing, correct? Yes. Is that they don't see a son of God. And I actually preached on this the other day when... We were celebrating a feast of, of how God sees us, and He doesn't see race, He doesn't see wealth, He sees the heart of the individual. And, and at the heart of this, racism is, is that we don't see that. We see a color rather than a person. Well, and even biblically, if you look in First, in first Samuel 16, you know, when Samuel goes to the house of Jesse to anoint the new king of Israel, Jesse has eight sons. He only lines up seven, Eliab, yeah. Abinadab, <laughs> Shema, and four other sons. And he sees Eliab, he goes, oh, he, you know, he's probably like, this dude right here, yeah. he looks like a king. Yeah. He goes to pour the oil and says, nope, not him. Mm -hmm. right. And I, I imagine Sam, he's probably going, wait a minute. He's like, there's Jesse, I'm at the right house, here are the sons, what's the problem? Yeah. And what does the Lord say to him? Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks on the Heart, heart. Amen. right? And leb in Hebrew, which doesn't mean just the heart that pumps blood through the body. Amen. It's called the seat of the will. That's the place where your desire for God lives inside of you. And that's the way we need to see people. And then he chose David. Just saying. That's right. That's so right. stay with that's us. Right. We'll be back in just a second. So to put it plainly, my thoughts are just that God loves every one of us. He doesn't judge any of us based on anything. He loves us no matter what through our sins. He forgives us. He loves us. He died for us. And I think that plainly Jesus wouldn't judge me based on the color of my skin. So it's really hard to know that I have brothers and sisters who are doing that and not living through Jesus when they do that. So I think that the way we should view racism as Catholics is how Jesus commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And I think that racism spits in the face of Jesus by defiling one of his greatest commandments. Walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage in the Holy Land, Poland, France, Austria, Italy, and more destinations. On each pilgrimage, you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about a Catholic response to racism, which has been a uh, a plague in our country's history, and, and you really share some of Father Tolton's experiences of, of that. Um, have we changed much? H have we furthered? Have we, are we doing better in the country? Well, a lot of people would say yes, and a lot of people would say no, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because um, when you, we have, because we had a black president, right? So look, we're making progress. Right, look yeah. how much progress we've made. Uh, then at the same time, you have like the George Floyd incident, thing like, so see, we still, we still have problems, right? right. right? So um, have we made progress? When you look at, you know, men like Dr. Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, who have really brought great awareness uh, to the issues of race and to justice, um, I, I think in, in that sense, we've made progress, but we're still, like I said, we're human beings that are sinful, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, um, and, and, and we will talk about this, I'm sure, in the last segment, but I believe with all my heart that the Catholic Church is the hope for mm. overcoming this sin of racism. Yeah. I, re I really believe You know, I, I think it can be argued that we're in a period of regression. Uh, Martin Luther King seized upon uh, the necessary insight that you judge a man based on his character, the content of his character, the state of his soul, 
but not the color of his skin. Yet we have turned that upside down. Increasingly, we, we live in a hyper-racialized environment where the color of the skin is all that matters. And nowadays, if you have the wrong color, uh, you're anathematized. I mean, that, that's not progress. No, it's not. You know, I think we, th even Catholics view their faith as sort of dessert icing on the cake, you know, something that you add to a good dinner. But, you know, the culture itself is the main event. When the Word of God is the only thing that really defines reality with precision and accuracy. So even when we go back to Genesis chapter 10, I think the tendency for many Catholics is to default to say, well, that's primeval. You know, if that's history, it's mostly mythological. Mm -hmm. But in Genesis 10, Ancient Israel had something that no other people had, and that is the table of nations, where all the 70 nations are shown to be descended from Noah through his three sons. And so in Genesis 10, you have the table of nations, which is really the family of nations. In Genesis 11, you have the Tower of Babel to show how one big family becomes one big broken family. But the promise that God makes with Abraham in Genesis 12 is to bless all the families of the earth. Now, the one who blesses is a father. So God is promising to become a father, and he's blessing all the families of the earth, which are really one family as of two chapters before. Mm. When you look at that and allow that to define your worldview, Israel was the only nation that had a chapter in its sacred book that showed us that even our enemies are our brothers. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even our rivals are part of a family that is broken, that God as a father is intent upon reuniting. And, and so we don't need Ancestry.com to prove that we're all interrelated. All we've got to recognize is the Word of God from God's fatherly perspective. He says, you've lost track of all of the unity because of the ethnic rivalry, the racial hatred, and all of these divisions. But this is not only quaint, spiritual, mm, warm, fuzzy truth, it's reality. It's objective reality. Mm. And only the faith is able to restore reason to recognize that, wait a second, this is not icing. This is not kind of a sweetener added to kind of help Catholics to be politically correct. This is the only United Nations that will ever work, the Catholic Church. That's right. And Jesus does say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Yeah. And, and he reminds them of the two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So, Dr. Hahn, your point is well taken because Jesus drives that point home. And, and the thing is today, to your point, Dr. Martin, <laughs> if, if you don't go along with the, 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 the consume the Kool-Aid of the culture, you get canceled, mm -hmm. yeah, right? You get right. deplatformed. Right. Right. But what's interesting to me is who doesn't get deplatformed? Like Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. Yeah. You know, the, the largest, the, uh, uh, the, the single cause of, the leading cause of death for black Americans in this country is abortion. Right. You know, something more than heart attacks, AIDS um, combined, yeah. you know. Um, and, and so she was a racist and a eugenicist who, and, and I, I went to Library of Congress, I saw her actual writings. Yeah. And she said she does not want people to know that she's trying to exterminate the Negro population. Exterminate, that's her words, right? right. All right? Through, through her organization, which now we know today is Planned Parenthood. Yeah, no, we've sanitized her message and sort oh. of sanctified yeah, I the mean, messenger. We falsified it. It's, it. It's I mean, simply yeah, really fascism. distorted it. Mm -hmm. yeah, fascism when you, when you read, you, you quote her directly. I mean, it's, it's even hard to read. You know, that she would say that they are unfit, they are inferior, uh, you should force sterilization to make sure the black community does I mean, and, and she doesn't get canceled. It's just, <laughs> it's... It, and, it, you know, in the 60s and 70s, I remember when Re Reverend Jesse Jackson would just confront this and say, this is racism, this is, you know, genocide. And then he flipped on yeah. abortion. But he recognized that Planned Parenthood in general, but also abortion was wiping out, but it wasn't accidental. It was deliberate. And then all suddenly it just vanished from his rhetoric. But the reality remained, and still to this day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when you uh, when you were dealing with the the study of this and and just learning more about his life, um, how do you how do you not get angry about it? Mm -hmm. you, you know, you talked about how the fact that he didn't leave and he persevered, and and how do you wrestle with that? And how do you pray through that? And and how do you 
not not just get so frustrated and just get angry. Well, that, I, and I've experienced that myself. Yeah. You know, um, I, even though I was in law enforcement for 23 years, I've been pulled over for driving while black. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, and then when they ran me, they're like, oh, okay, thank See, you. Yeah, <laughs> sir, yeah. You know, but, but, but there's so many other people that don't get that get out of a jail card, you know, when, right, when that right, happens. Right, right. You know, um, and so the, the part of a, a Tolton story that really um, inspired me was when he was going through his studies when the Franciscans and others were kind of helping him prepare for seminary. And he got to the part about studying St. Thomas Aquinas' teaching on justice. Mm. And he's he, oh, I love and that he section. sees the contradiction. He's like, Thomas Aquinas is teaching this, but look at the reality. Look at what my people are enduring. Look, how come they're not following what, what they're teaching here? Right. And he was frustrated. He was, and when he was rejected over and over again, he became frustrated. Um, he, he called it an annealing. A holy frustration. Yeah, yeah in yeah, his yeah, life. Yeah, and, uh, but, but he was able to persevere through that because he trusted God. No. You know, that, that was the key. You that, never that, lost to trust God. That was one of the highlights of the book, that studying in Rome, reading St. Thomas Aquinas, right. and discovering his definition of justice, yeah. it's suddenly a no-brainer. Yeah. Right. And yet, given the culture, you know, and this comes in the middle of page 88 and 89, where he goes on and on about the hatred and the division and, and the anger. I mean, you can hear in his tone the fact that it isn't like, well, we'll just forget about all of that. It's like, this is Aquinas on justice. Right. And why are bishops and priests rationalizing injustice? Exactly. It's stunning. And yet it's not gone. Yeah, I mean, but, but the disconnect that you, you, uh, you speak of is not exactly a, a sunburst. I mean, it happens all the time. That's right. What, what Henry James calls the black and merciless things in the human heart. I mean, that's what he writes about. That's what provides great fiction, conflict, moral uh, dilemmas. Uh, and the, the, uh, the shadow falls necessarily between the ideals we profess and the pretty wretched performance we turn in. So that, that's not anything new. That's not a revelation. But what you do about it, you, you, you renew your effort to somehow conform behavior, statistical behavior, to the ideal. And that's tough. I mean, that's like an asymptotic curve. You never reach the baseline, but you never give up. And that's what so inspires people about this guy. He doesn't surrender. He doesn't throw in the towel. He still holds aloft the ideal, and he sees the church as really the only legitimate vehicle for its uh, realization. And, and that's, that's very comforting. And that's when we see th uh, the experience of seeing someone made in the image and likeness of God, which is what uh, Father Tolton did so well, or St. Teresa of Calcutta, yeah. when she was working with the poorest of the poor uh, on the streets, people with limbs falling off because of leprosy or pleurisy, whatever disease they had. She saw Jesus in them. Right. So when I look at you, yeah. Dr. Martin, you, Father Pavanka, you, Dr. Han, I don't see white. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see three people who I have tremendous respect and admiration for, for years, especially you, Dr. Han. I mean, oh, listen to your spare. takes when I was, I mean, that really tra was transformative. And to see what's happened with Franciscan University yeah. and the great influence that it has in the, in the Catholic, how it's staying Catholic in the midst of this culture today. And Dr. Martin, you're just tremendous intellect. That's inspiring to me. And I don't want to diminish that by just seeing white. You know, I, I want to see you. Yeah. And that's what the Catholic Church, yeah. I think, can help us do more than any other institution yeah. literally in the world today. Well, you have and, that. and by the way, I've got to add, when we brought you to campus within the last year or two, and you spoke at the J.C. Williams Center, I was there on the steps because it was over, it was, it was packed beyond, you know, standing room only. And uh, what you shared from your experience, but from the Word of God, as a minister, as a deacon, uh, I don't think my eyes were the only wet ones. No, I mean, everyone was just, it was stunning to recognize that we're being called to a deep repentance that goes beyond politics. Yes, absolutely. And I think what was important just about that and, and what you continue to do is, is I, I think sometimes there, people are anxious. You know, we don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, but there's a way that you present that is, that is pastoral, that's sensitive, that's loving, that's kind, that, that invites us to, okay, we need to take a look at this. And without being defensive, without saying, you know, I'm the worst person in the world. I mean, right now, the, you know, the whole white and it's bad to be white and the critical race, all that kind of thing. And, and I think people are pushing back from that, but I think you do a beautiful job at inviting reflection 
and, and, and meditation and it's, it's just the way that you present it in such a loving kind well, manner. Well, you, I think you don't look fantastic. like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, but you certainly <laughs> talk like her. I mean, yeah. the same accent. Of that, that vignette that you reproduce uh, in the book is really moving. I mean, the journalist who's sort of exasperated with her. How can you hang out with these people who look this way? And, and she's incredulous. Look like what? What are you talking about? I see Jesus in these people, an extension of the Son of God. And I'm almost tempted to genuflect before these lepers. Mm -hmm. I, mean, that's, I think that's the mindset we need. Yeah, and, that, and that's what inspired me, I think, in my approach. Um, uh, it's, it was Father Tolton and the way he approached what was happening to him yeah. and what was happening, how he responded, what was going on around him, not with violence, not with anger, not with animosity or hatred, yeah. but he tried to understand. He responded with love. You know, and, and that is the absolute key. Right. You know, uh, 1 John 4, 16 is so inspiring to me. God is love. And he who lives in love lives in God, and God lives in him. That's divinization. That, that is, I, sometimes I go to adoration and just reflect on that one line for like half an hour. I mean, to live in God and that. God lives in us, yeah. that's what helps us to take the blinders off. Right, right. So we can see people the way God sees them, so we can look at someone through God's eyes. The, the last line of Genesis chapter 2, the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed because mm -hmm. they were seeing each other the way God sees them. Right. And that's what we need to do. That, to, <laughs> that I think the Catholic Church can do this, I think, better than anyone else to help us overcome the sin of racism. Yeah. One of the lines of Pope Francis in his first encyclical when he stated that we tear down the walls and we see faces in stories, right? And, and that we realize that we're not that different, that our stories, our experiences um, are not that different at the human heart, so. Well, we'll be right back for more Franciscan University prevents, uh, Presents. I invite you to stay with us. On Thanksgiving, I went to daily mass, um, and they did like a blessing of the breads. And so every different um, culture brought up a different bread to be blessed. Um, and then at the end, kind of the culmination of it all was them bringing up the gifts, bringing up the bread to become the Eucharistic bread. Um, and I think that was just a perfect um, representation of just what the Lord desires for us and what He desires to do. Um, to gather his scattered children to become one body of Christ. What if you discovered a university with unmatched science, faculty, and programs? A place where you didn't have to choose science over faith. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith-inspired, student-focused, research-driven programs leading to satisfying careers in medicine, scientific research, engineering, computer science, and many more science and health fields. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, education is more than just a word, it's a discovery. Welcome back and thanks for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we record in the Com Art Studio here at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment and members of our theology faculty, Dr. Martin and Dr. Hahn, and I are discussing a Catholic response to racism with Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Uh, Deacon, how, how can a parish, what would you like to see in a parish to, to try to deal with some of these really difficult issues? Yeah, and, and this is an issue for parishes. Yeah. You know, uh, just a little vignette. I, I was driving to a parish in Florida. Usually they pick me up, but this is about two hours from the airport, so they had me rent a car. And, but they gave me directions to the church, not to the rectory. And so I got to church, I'm like, oh, the rectory's not here. So I got out to ask someone where the rectory was, and, and the person came out of church, I saw, I asked them, and I walked up to them, before I could say anything, he said, oh, the St. Vincent de Paul is closed today. <laughs> yep. And I said, well, that's nice information. Yeah, but but you see that poster on the door? That's me. That's me. <laughs> I'm actually here for the mission. I'm just trying to find the rectory so I can at least meet Father before Mass this evening. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. The other, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah. I mean, stuff like that, right? We, see, the, the thing is, sometimes we treat our communities and parishes in silos. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you may have a Hispanic community or a Vietnamese community or a, you know, uh, a, a, a Nigerian community in your parish, and they have their own mass. Right, right. And so we get so focused on uh, on us, so do we forget that there's this, this whole other community with our, within our own parish? And so what we need to do, I think, is to, to, um, to break down those walls, or to, is to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest ways, simple ways, 
have food, have a party. <laughs> you know, ha I mean, have a potluck. Yeah, yeah. Have all the different cultural people bring their food, and, and, you know, and, and so everybody meets together. Make sure that everyone sitting at the tables are all mixed. You're not, you're not sitting with your yeah, clique right, and your right, group. Right. And then have some people get up, people of color get up, and talk about their experience. Here's what it's like being a Catholic in the United States or a Catholic in this parish since we moved here from Vietnam, right. from Ethiopia, right. Right. from Cuba, you know, uh, and, and, and share. So now that's not just someone that you kind of see as they're going to their mass. This, you, you go, wait a minute. I, they're having the same struggle that, that I'm having with my kids. Mm -hmm. They're having, exactly. and now you stories, begin to right. see a human right. being. Now you right. begin to see a person. Yeah. Um, some other things, it's very, very simple things. In our parish, for example, we have a, a, a large Vietnamese community. Um, and, and so in our parish, we have our, in the church, a beautiful statue of Our Lady of Lavang. Gorgeous depiction of our Blessed Mother and the Christ Child with Vietnamese features. Mm -hmm. And she's wearing the blue and white, but with a Vietnamese style. It's gorgeous. We have St. Martin de Porres in the church, right? So, so the church looks like the people that worship there. Right. You know, very, very simple things like that. Even in the hallways, you know, what's Saint, you may be St. Catherine of Siena, but how come you don't have, you know, uh, uh, Martin de Porres or, or Juan Diego or yeah, some yeah. saints of color? So that when you, the kids come in, they see that, oh, this is the church too. This is what the church looks like as well. See? Yeah, I mean, food and iconography, I mean, that really does show that our Catholic sensibilities have got to be strengthened, but especially food, especially eating together. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think of when Jesus fed the 5,000, and then he leaves the ethnic land of Israel and feeds the 4,000. And then he warns against the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't agree on much, but they agreed on one thing, that is you don't fellowship or eat meals with the goyim, which in Hebrew means Gentiles, nations. But the connotation for goy or goyim is the swine, the unclean, you know. And, and so food becomes this division. And the Eucharist obviously becomes the unity. But even Peter in Acts 10, it took three times for that apocalyptic vision of the sheep coming down from heaven, you know, with all of these animals, rise, kill, and eat. I've never eaten anything unclean. What the Lord has cleansed you must not call unclean. Mm -hmm. Three times, then finally the knock on the door, a Gentile, you know, so that the, the inner logic of the food laws of Moses showed that the Gentiles are idolaters and temporarily you don't have enough grace to convert them. They'll pervert you. But when Christ comes and the Eucharist is established, suddenly Peter has to learn the lesson that even a Galilean fisherman didn't realize, that the Lord has cleansed the Gentiles and through baptism will unite them at this table, you know. And I think 2,000 years later, we're still having to learn this lesson, mm -hmm. that it's not just the Eucharist, it's the hospitality that flows from the table of the Lord. Because when you eat with people, you end up discovering the obvious. We're all family That's from right. God's fatherly. And when you don't eat with people, you back yourself into all kinds of false conclusions and distorted views. You know, it, it didn't surprise me at all in, in reading the narrative of his life that while Americans uh, uh, would disdain him and reject him, you know, dismiss uh, his vocation to become a priest. Rome was wonderfully hospitable because that's the nature of Rome. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the colonnade designed by Bernini and it's literally reaching out, it's expansive, a symbol of uh, solidarity as if the mother wants all the pilgrims on the planet mm -hmm. to come home. Here is this ample bosom that will nourish you forever. And it doesn't matter what color your, your skin is, how tall you are, how smart, how clever. None of that matters. I mean, isn't this the lesson that Jesus teaches when he confronts the woman at the well in John's gospel, the Samaritan? You would think that that was pretty divisive. That's a sundering difference. You're not one of us. You're not a Jew. You're a Samaritan. I'm, I'm not going to defile myself by having a glass, a cup of water with you. And yet none of those distinctions matter. Everything is leveled. Christ is the unifier. Right. Yeah, we could do the same thing in our schools, right? right. You know, because th there is a Black Catholic History Month, right? And I'm not saying that, that that's a bad thing and we shouldn't have it. But, 
you know, uh, I agree in a sense with Morgan Freeman. I don't want my history relegated to a month. A month. <laughs> you know, what, what, what it should be is that this, you know, saints of color should be part of the normal offering all throughout the entire catechetical life of a of a young person. Yeah. So it's not just, okay, we're going to study all these things. Oh, no, here's this thing. It's, it's, right, right. it's just part of it. It's just right. normal. Right. You know, that, that I would love to see that. And, you know, and, and one thing, uh, I want to make sure I say this, is that if, if someone has trouble struggling with all of this, you know, I, I, whenever I'm around a person of color, a black person, I feel nervous. I don't know why. I don't want to feel that way. Yeah. I would love if someone just came up to me and said that and said, can, can we please talk about that? That would be awesome because that's, that's honest and that's real. Right. That's real. You're not hiding it. You're not trying to hide behind it. You're, right. you're, you're not trying to struggle with yourself. Talk, talk, talk about it. Yeah. You know? Part of that talk is just, it. It just when you say that's interesting. I'm from a small town. There were two black people in my town. I mean, it just, it was not my experience. So it was actually coming to Steubenville the first time that I had a friend who was an African-American. But it was just, it was foreign because it was never my experience. So I think your point is well taken. It's just be honest, you know, just talk about what's going on and put that out there and you can work through things. It doesn't mean that the person's necessarily bad. It's just right. not been their experience. Right. But I think you're pointing to the reality of how politicized this thing has become. And it's hard to know exactly where to kind of come together and how to start that discussion when it is so politicized, you know. It, but I think that when, when you recognize God, we bear his image and likeness, we have the word of God, we share a faith, you know, this is how it's going to be rebuilt. And it won't be easy, it won't be fast, but it will make it possible in a way that politicians who weaponize race will never do. They're going to undo what little the church has accomplished. You know, you mentioned the Samaritan woman, you know, in John 4. I'm thinking of Philip, you know, <laughs> your, your patron, and uh, how St. Philip was in Acts 8, the one who broke through and evangelized the Samaritans. You did what? So the Jerusalem apostles have to send Peter and John up to lay hands upon them just to kind of create, you know, or to ex uh, prevent a, a schism. And then Philip is with the Ethiopian eunuch yeah. who's reading Isaiah 53 and not only explains that Jesus is the suffering servant, but there's water, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And so the first African-American takes the Christian faith back to Ethiopia, you know, and Philip becomes this figure that shows us that it's not going to be easy. You know, the supernatural grace of Christ makes it possible, not easy. Mm -hmm. But apart from Christ, we won't succeed. Amen. Amen. And Deacon, you talk in the book again about what a parish can do. You also spend some time about what a family can do. You give some practical ideas about how a family can do with that. Maybe you could speak to some of those. Mm. Yeah, because the, the, the family is the foundation for civilization, culture, and society. It's the domestic church, the church of the home. It's the place where you're supposed to first fall in love with Jesus, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, one of the things I would say, first of all, turn the television off. <laughs> you know, get out. I mean, I'm not even on really social media that much anymore. I, I, I rarely ever watch television, yeah. you know? Um, uh, so, so get away from those things. And even, again, bring the iconography into your home, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So have some pictures of different saints up around your home. I think um, parents being, I think the greatest way that children learn is from the witness of their own parents. Mm -hmm. So when the parents are, 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 are uh, being an example, you know, bringing people of color into the home and showing and by, by that example, that what is it? Hey, you know, this is just normal having people of color around and interact with people. That, that says a lot to the children, mm -hmm. you know, uh, about how they are to look at and treat people that are different than right. they are. Right. Yeah, different, maybe culturally, different in language, but same because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all one family of God. Yeah. Yeah, we're never going to escape the, the encounter with the other. I mean, that's what threatened you, oh, those be. two black people yeah. you had never seen before. I mean, that, that, that is sort of unsettling. Uh, my, uh, my, my wife's uh, grandmother was sunk in, in senility in the last months of her life when I was introduced to the family. And she would clutch her handbag whenever I would walk close by as if she thought I was going to steal from her. I mean, that was a kind of paranoia, but I was other. She couldn't, she couldn't fix me uh, in a time or place, so I was threatening, menacing to her. That's what we have to overcome. But you can't eliminate the experience with the other. You're always going to be black, and I'm not black. But what transcends 
those accidental differences is the fact that we're brothers under the flesh beneath the fatherhood of a common God. Amen. That should be the cement. Yes. Amen. And then the flesh and the blood that family members share is Eucharistic. Yes. And that yes. is what heals. You know, yes. I remember, you know, growing up in Bethel Park and my best friend lived next door. But I didn't know until years later that he was not allowed over to my house because we were the Protestants. Mm. No, he was allowed one time to watch the funeral mass for JFK when I was watching that. So he was allowed in my house, mm. you know, and I was over at his house, but I would hear my parents talk about the Irish. Oh. You know, yeah. and so the Germans, the Irish, the, and even here in Steubenville, you have the parishes. Right. St. Anthony's was for the Irish, St. Stanislaus sure. for the Polish, sure. St. Peter's was for, you know, the Irish. And, you know, across the board, these neighborhoods were deeply divided, and not only in their parishes, but their schools, their sports, you know. And then, of course, through intermarriage and whatever right. else happened to the culture, these things are overcome. But you look at Peter in Acts 10 and how hard it was for him, and you realize that anti-Semitism is kind of matched by an anti-Goyism. Mm -hmm. And across the board, you know, you have these deep seismic division, divisions that Christ alone can heal. Amen. Yeah, I mean, the differences should be enriching. They, they shouldn't be a struggle. Yes. Yeah, the fact that you're Absolutely. black should not be repellent. Yes. No. It should be an invitation to get to know this guy. Absolutely. He's different. Mm. I mean, that's, that's genuine diversity. Yeah. Beautifully well said. Yeah. Well said. Some of the experiences I've been able to have is, is to be in very diverse international groups. And, and that's, I think, the church is most beautiful. When you look out, like in your parish, you've got the Vietnamese, you've got the African American, you've got the Hispanic, the Latino. The, there's something actually, and I, I think very Catholic about that. That uh, some of the, my experiences of some of the Protestant groups is that they all look identical, and and I think Catholic provides us an opportunity for diversity that's really beautiful. Yeah, okay, so just practically with the mom and the dad, how do they talk to their kids? What what do they say? I mean, is there something, uh, a little tidbit that you invite them to? Yeah, so I would just in, encourage them to just uh, to, you know and teach their children that they, we're all children of God. We mm -hmm. all come in different colors and stuff, like a box of crayons, right? You show yeah, yeah. They're, they're all different colors, but they all live together in harmony, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's, it's very simple examples. Um, and, and through a life of prayer, showing the teachings of Jesus, this is who we follow. You're going to see things in the culture that are contrary to this, but we follow the, the so truth. To, so to call that out for them, to, to point that out, that what's going on, what they're seeing is, is bad, it's wrong, and then try to give them the truth in the light of that. Absolutely, because ultimately truth is a person. Right. It's not a philosophy. It's not a construct. It's a person, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Up next, our panel and our guest will share our final thoughts in responding to racism. Please stay with us. Personally, I don't like the term colorblind just because Jesus made us all individually, and I think that we should see color, and I don't think we should be colorblind, and we should acknowledge those differences between us. But I think that Color should not determine how we view the person and we should see the person as a whole. There is a place where education begins and faith and reason connect. Franciscan University of Steubenville's online programs will advance your career through an e-learning experience that's both academically excellent and passionately Catholic. With online degrees taught by full-time professors in theology, catechetics, business, education, and other disciplines, you can earn your master's degree online without changing your lifestyle. Find out more today at franciscan.edu, where your faith and career can connect online. And welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment, so Regis, if you'd offer your final thoughts. Yeah, uh, it has always uh, uh, struck me as uh, really sort of ludicrous uh, to imagine people in strictly racial categories. I mean, it's unjust, it's ungenerous, and, and within that racial uh, matrix, uh, the differences, I think, are far more instructive uh, than those areas where you, you march in lockstep, you know, like the Rockettes uh, at the Radio City Music Hall in New York. You're not at all like that. Black people are not a monolith. 
Uh, and their opinions are not a function of their pigmentation. I mean, you are far more different from the sort of black people that parade themselves on television, the opinion makers, the taste makers, uh, who, who parrot a liberal line, which is not only boring, but it's destructive. I mean, you're free. You're able to speak as a member of the body of Christ, and that's very liberating. The differences persist. Uh, and we mustn't discount them. I, I think it's, 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 it's blind uh, to pretend that, that races don't exist. But what we have to do is stimulate the capacity for love that makes those differences merely accidental, and, and they don't disturb or inconvenience the essential matter, which is you're an image of God, imago dei, and like the rest of us, you aspire to achieve the perfect likeness uh, unto Christ. Uh, when I was uh, drafted into the Army, I was stuck at Fort Dix in New Jersey for nine hellish weeks, <laughs> surrounded by odious uh, uh, sergeants, all white, but the guys in my platoon were mostly black. And we got along splendidly because we viewed a common enemy. There was a solidarity in suffering, and we were oppressed by these people, and, and we found things in common. And what really uh, instructed me was the fact that despite the same color, they were so different, the idiosyncrasies among those black uh, uh, privates. That, that's what was truly uh, amazing. That's enriching. Mm. And too bad we can't see beyond the accidents to try to lay hold of the essence. If we did, this would be a far lovelier uh, culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Regis, and I, maybe a future program. We could talk more about your experience in the <laughs> Army. <laughs> I, I, I would like to hear more about that. Yeah. Dr. Hahn. Two thoughts, uh, briefly, but they're big ideas. One is Scripture as the Word of God, and the other is the notion of the family. Um, I think we're too quick to be dismissive of Scripture as the Word of God and possessing a unique capacity to transform our lives, our worldview, the way we tie our shoes. Uh, you know, and you have Eric Auerbach in his book Mimesis, who points out that in Western literature, you know, you have the so-called Western canon of Chaucer and Dante and Shakespeare and all of those dead white men, you know, that are pilloried by the postmoderns and deconstructionists. And yet we tend to relegate Scripture to the Western canon. Well, guess what? It's not part of the Western canon. It's the universal canon. And if we really took more seriously than most even Catholic academics do, that this literature, which just comes in a kind of humble Hebrew form, you know, what one of my friends said, you know, Yiddish lore, uh, if we allowed that humble, powerful word to transform us, I think we would see that you know, covenant is not just some abstract concept. It's the concrete reality that the human race is God's family, broken by sin, but redeemed by Christ. And, you know, it's not just a family in some vague sense of a metaphor. You know, I think of crystal, you know, it's a quartz that's crystalline. When you shatter it, all of the fragments are crystalline. They retain that structure. The human race is a family of families. It's a broken family. And now we see dysfunctional and broken families in every neighborhood as well. The Word of God alone is what's powerful and capable of transforming it, but it has to take place in the households, as you were pointing out, as he discovered too, mm -hmm. to see, in fact, the role of the family in Father Augustus Tolton's own conversion and his own sense of vocation. That is every bit as true today as it was back then and will always be. So taking God at His Word and allowing Him to heal our homes and to create in the church a real household of faith that overcomes divisions. Mm -hmm. Those are those Great. two takeaways. Great. Thanks, Scott. Deacon, your final thoughts. Just uh, beautifully, just, uh, as, I, as I do in the book, just a short reflection on the, on the Good Samaritan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. all know that, that story because uh, Jesus talked about that because along that road, people would have known that there were robbers. So that, that was a real thing. But we see the, 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 the priest walk by the man on the side of the road. And we see the Levite walk by the man on the side of the road. But it's the Samaritan who they're supposed to hate, right. you know, who, who takes pity and has mercy mm -hmm. and takes him to the, the, the hotel and he, pay, you know, cleans his wounds and pays for him. He says, if whatever, you, you know, it costs, I'll get you on the way back. Mm -hmm. um, 
how, how, now, in retrospect, we always look back and say, oh, I would have done that too. <laughs> but what if that person side of the road was your rapist? Yeah, yeah. The person who molested you as a child, the person who, who, who drove drunk and killed your spouse, right? The anger and the hatred we feel would burn in our hearts like a fire. And we would be like, yeah, you, you deserve it, right. right? But Jesus calls us to do, to, to, to do more, to do different, to look at that person and to see someone made in God's image and likeness. So the, the takeaway for me is we must be the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I think the Catholic Church can take the lead in this. We must be the Samaritan. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Deacon. Uh, we have uh, an article that was written by Deacon. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, we have this available to you. It's called Building a Civilization of Love, a Catholic Response to Racism written by Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, uh, and it's yours uh, if you simply go online to faithandreason.com or call the number that you'll see on the screen in just a moment. Uh, I recall when I was 21 years old, again, I'm raised in a small town in, in southwest Colorado, and I went to Louisiana. And somebody was showing me around, and they said, you know, this is the church I was on net, the, where you're going to do your retreats. But we had gone by a church, and I said, oh, I thought that was the church. And they said, no, that's the black church. And it was the first time I, I was like, what do you mean? There's, well, there's a church for the whites and there's a church for the blacks. And I was just like appalled at this. Later in the day, I was uh, taking a prayer time and I was raised in a small town again in Colorado and we had our white parish and we had our Mexican parish. And it was just what I was raised with. Now, it was a little bit different because my mom and dad were involved in a Curcio ministry, which was largely with the Hispanic population. So I was felt free to go to the other parish and my family would go to the Mexican parish. But it was interesting that, that given that that's what I was raised in, I didn't think anything about it. And it caused me to have to see that there was a black parish and a white that made me think about this differently. And, and it opened my eyes, I think, to the conversation that we, we've been speaking about that, that led me to understand and look more, I think, personally that, as you stated, that God sees the heart, that, that it's not a question of, of our bank accounts or our past, our color, the language we speak, but God sees the heart. Um, I recall when I was, had the opportunity just last year to be able to go to Iraq, and the theme of the Holy Father's visit was, uh, we are brothers. And, and I was just struck by that, that in the midst uh, of a world that has been fighting and, and so at odds, that ultimately that's what they wanted to focus on. So I would say that, that uh, ultimately we are brothers, and, and, and we have the same Father in heaven, and the same Jesus that redeemed you has redeemed me, has redeemed all of humanity. And to the degree that we focus on those fundamental truths and realities, we experience the Lord's presence in, in our relationship. So thank you so much. Thank you for your honesty, for your vulnerability, and just a blessing to have you here with thank us. Thank you. It's a great blessing to be here. Thank you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, this morning, and we ask your grace and your peace uh, to be present. Jesus, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, and your Holy Spirit, which unites, never divides, that your Spirit would unite us, your church, in Jesus, in your name, in your as your priest, uh, break the sin of, of racism in our country and the sin of racism still present in our church. Bring your freedom, your, your peace, your healing, and your presence. May Almighty God bless those, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com where you can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents. Or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu. Or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800-783-6447.